September's roommate was Mandy Janot, a fair complexion girl of 18 from New Orleans. And while she carried significantly more weight than needed on her barely five foot frame, it didn't necessarily diminish her attractiveness, especially when she cinched her belt tightly at the waist and her figure suddenly appeared. She had piercing gray eyes, a barely pointed nose, and white forehead fully covered by a screen of neatly trimmed bangs sweeping back into a waterfall of raven-colored hair that fell across her left shoulder in a lustrous swirl, hair so straight each strand seemed to move with just the wave of a hand. Two rows of tiny straight teeth hidden behind thin lips and a narrow mouth were buried in a cute brown face long since ruined by deep scarring from acne. She had barely enough melanin in her skin to pass the Negro, but you had to look closely, and even then it was a stretch, but it was a long one. So that gives you an idea in terms of how Mandy, what Mandy's yeah. appearance is. Very good. Um, she, uh, September is kind of struck me because of the way Mandy carries herself. So she asked, she said, are you a Creole? September asked, her pint-sized 45 record player pumping out Jackie Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, if I am, said Mandy, it doesn't give me any special privileges. Mm -hmm. Knowing that her fair skin and straight hair were the order of the day. You want a cigarette, she asked, pulling out a pack of camels, lighting one, blowing a cloud of smoke between them, offering a pack to September. September eyebrows arched together in a frown of curiosity. A cigarette? Saying it like it was a foreign language. You actually smoke? All the girls I know smoke, said Manny. I didn't start this until the summer. I don't know, September said it curiously, but not really ready to learn and saying yes. You cough a lot in the beginning, Manny said. Gee, you get used to it. it. Gives you a nice little buzz for a hot second. I mean, it's nothing to write. I mean, it's nothing to write home about, but you can feel it. I was just wondering, September added, getting back to her point, why I asked if you were Creole. You got that good hair, and coming from New Orleans, I just figured you for a Creole. Perry Mott, that's a boy back in L.A., he's got good hair like you too, but he says he's not a Creole. He says you have to have some French in you to be a Creole. Is that true? Creole is just a name, Mandy said, not looking at September and not investing much in the word, but out of habit running her fingers through the bundle of loose hair at her shoulder. I think, September said, I think if I was light skin like you and had good hair, I'd want to pass. Pass? Mandy said, as, as if it was a foreign word, as if she was expected to spell it out in a spelling bee. You mean pass for white? Mandy laughed and grunted deep in her throat. Girl, you are really lame. Negroes don't do that anymore. That was back at the turn of the century, something our grandparents did. Why in heaven's name would you want to pass as good as you look? September said, if you were dark like me, you'd understand. Mandy said, and you don't think I get treated the same way? September said, I know you don't. Mandy said, I still get called nigger just like you. September said, I can tell your color, so can other negroes, but white people don't know that you're colored. If they call you nigger, it's probably because you tell them. Well, of course I tell them, Mandy said, eyebrows nodding together in deep disbelief. Why would not? I'm not ashamed of being colored. Are you? And realized for the first time that September was, that her shame about her dark color was at the very core of her personality. Mm -hmm. So that, that gives you another mm -hmm. perspective from an Andy A. Secondary character about that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what they got there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I told you that, that this takes place during the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. So, September, as a result of not hearing from Benny Boy and Mandy saying, well, let's get involved in Civil Rights. So she gets all involved in this. And because she's so frustrated at not hearing from Benny Boy, she hasn't gone back to see him yet. Mm -hmm. Mandy says, well, I'm going to bring you home with me to New Orleans for Christmas. This is Christmas time. I'm going to come home for the summer. This is the first. She's been away from school for six months, and now it's Christmas. And so instead of going home to L.A., Mandy's going to take her down to New Orleans. And this, this is her arrival in New Orleans. The train arriving in New Orleans, Mandy was on the platform hanging with the porter when September rushed over to her bathroom and not really noticing the signs start, not really noticing the signs started to enter the white door just as a heavy set, gray haired white woman with tired, sagging face, heavy eyebrows, and too much rouge on a pair of wrinkled cheeks was coming out and stood blocking her way. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, nigger, just where do you think you're going? she shouted. 
loud enough to draw the attention of a few sympathetic whites standing around, even fewer blacks not wanting to get involved. Mm -hmm. And thinking September was a maid, went on saying, you know better than to come into a white woman's bathroom without your uniform. Mm -hmm. I ought to have your job for this. Where's your supervisor? The white lady expecting September to apologize deferentially, to beg and plead profusely for her job. Mm -hmm. Stunned, September said indignantly, I beg your pardon, what did you just call me? You uppity nigger, don't you sass me back. Where's your uniform? <laughs> Having trouble gathering her thoughts, like she was having a bad dream, and finally saying, Uniform? What uniform? And after a moment, when it dawned on her that the white lady thought she was a maid, she said, Oh, oh no, miss, you got the wrong idea. I don't work here. I'm just visiting. September addressing her as miss, despite the insult, because respecting adults with the way she'd been raised, and adding naively, I think you owe me an apology. September's serious, not appreciating where she was not realizing anything she said was inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Me? Owe you an apology? The white lady said it with such profound disbelief she almost laughed. The nerve! Her stare in September so incredulous and malignant it seemed as if it was an agent of Lucifer itself. Mm -hmm. Then her thick pencil eyebrows suddenly going up with an understanding she didn't like and saying, Oh, I see. You one of them pushy educated niggers from up north. Gonna come down here and make trouble, huh? And then with both hands beginning to push September back out of the door and out into the lobby, all the while saying, can't you read your little piccaninny? And pointing quite forcefully to the quote, colored sign over the adjacent door. Happening so fast, September stunned into silent disbelief, backing away by reflex and instinct, the white lady following after her, pounding her forefinger into September's chest, continuing her, her tirade and saying, you little dumb black nigger you, you better learn your place while you're here if you know what's good for you. Her voice shrill and tinny, like the high-pitched squawk of a rooster. We're tired of your kind, she went on. All you smart-mouthed nigger communists coming down here from the north, trying to destroy everything we work for. You better watch yourself. Me owe you an apology, a nigger. That'll be the day. The only apology you'll ever get from me is at the end of a rope. The white lady standing there quietly, hands on her hips, eyes and attitude, daring September to cross the line. Acting now on impulse, September's anger rising beyond her indignation, she drew back her arm to slap her tormentor, but her arm suddenly hooked in midair. Mandy saying, come on, September, and pulling her away, the white lady still standing there glaring at her, then stomping heavily away and disappearing into the cavity of the train station, somewhere beyond the light applauding of a hostile white crowd gathered for the show. September indignant and saying to Mandy as she was being hustled away, the nerve of her calling me a nigger to my face. September continuing to resist Mandy's efforts to get her out of the station, looking back and starting to shout something over her shoulder towards the crowd, but Mandy talking to her, trying to calm her down and pulling her through the door and out of the station. Wow. That was September's initial introduction into real racism in terms, in terms of the South. So that sort of gives you an idea of what was going on there. Sometime later, September has become very, very involved and has gotten a lot of press. She gets right up to Jeff and Jeff and becoming quite prominent. And so she went on uh, a freedom ride. And I don't know if those of you are familiar with uh, freedom rides. If you remember, if you look at some of the movies, you've seen Eyes on the Prize, you see that there was a Greyhound bus that was on fire. The photographs, the famous photograph, they had, they had stopped this bus full of civil rights protesters somewhere in the South, might have been Alabama or Mississippi, and they torched it. And the, 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 the people were lucky to get out of the bus alive. They set the bus on fire. And that picture, you, you see it's free. I think it won a Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. And they going, they, uh, they we went on a freedom ride to integrate the bus stations and restaurants in Mississippi. And the, the plan was, by, by the civil rights people, is that let them arrest you and we will fill the jails up. <coughs> and so this all takes place in Jackson, Mississippi, which you didn't see the racism during that particular time. And so in September, is put in jail. She, she's incarcerated. Her, she had told her parents that she would be coming home for the summer uh, uh, to visit. But she was going to stop through New Orleans to visit Mandy. She didn't tell them that she was going to be on the freedom ride and visit Mandy. So uh, this, uh, she has written her mother, Dolores Jackson, from jail. 
And this is the letter. And Benny Boy has gone to visit because he was hoping September would be there to see her because he came home for the summer. But he did not realize that September was in jail too. So he's over at September's house hoping to see uh, September. And Mrs. Jackson shows him this letter that she's gotten from September. August 3rd, 1961, Mississippi State Penitentiary. Block D47, cell 96, Central Unit, Parchman, Mississippi. Dearest mother and dad, I guess by now you've seen the picture in jet, and you know that I'm in jail here in Mississippi. Only just this morning, one of the trustees here at Parchman showed me a copy. I guess you want to know why I lied to you in my letter. Well, it wasn't a complete lie. I really was on my way to New Orleans with Mandy. I had every intention of coming straight out to L.A. from there. That part was true. What I didn't tell you was that I had joined Corps back in February, and the trip to New Orleans was one of their freedom rides through the South that was due to end in New Orleans. I didn't tell you about Corps because I knew you'd both be against it. That picture of me and Mandy on the cover of Jet only tells part of the story. In truth, it's really been much worse. Up until now, I hadn't realized just how good we had it out there in L.A. until I experienced what Negroes go through here in the South. I never in my wildest dreams imagined the degree of human cruelty that white people were capable of inflicting on others. Mandy was seriously hurt and might lose her eye. Mr. Cecil Bruckner, our core field secretary, got word to us that her father had to take her to Boston to see high powered eye specialists because the damage was so severe. I've got my fingers crossed that she'll be okay. As for me, I'm okay now. I looked a mess when I first got to jail. I was covered from head to toe with bruises and cuts. I was so sore I could hardly walk. That was in the Hines County Jail here in Jackson, where they kept us for the first month. By the time they transferred us to the state penitentiary here at Parchman, just about all of my injuries had pretty much healed up. One of the scars on my neck from a cigarette burn got so infected that they had to have the doctor come in and treat it. Wow. He said I might have a keloid scar after it heals because some colored people with dark skin like mine get that. But so far it's healing up fine and it looks okay to me. Just a little pain. I've lost some weight because the food is so bad. They only serve us with beans and rice and cold toast in the morning. Every now and then we might get a piece of cold chicken for dinner. We have to wear these horrible looking drab gray uniforms. The prison cells are segregated and my cellmate is a girl from South Carolina named Jocelyn. She's a music major at Hampton University. We get one hour or so, one hour a day or so outside in the yard. The women at one time and the men at another. We don't get any reading material, not even a Bible. So to keep from being bored, we sing freedom songs all day long and late into the night. And because we do, the guards take our mattresses away and we have to sleep on cold cement benches. Mm -hmm. I guess you can imagine just how uncomfortable that is trying to sleep on a hard bench, especially since they keep the air conditioning on day and night and don't give us any blankets. It's a wonder we don't get pneumonia. Of course, here in jail, it's hard to communicate with anyone outside. I don't suspect you've received any of my letters. Word, worthy of the guards to just throw our letters in the trash can after they, after they give them to us. We get most of our information from trustees who bring us newspapers, or people from court, lawyers who visit us from time to time to see that we're not being mistreated. If you need to write me, you must send it to the core lawyer's address in front of the envelope. Just because we're in jail doesn't mean that we don't continue to protest. Besides the singing, some of the freedom writers are fasting. I couldn't go along with that. I've already lost enough weight as it is. But anyone has, but everyone has agreed that the core strategy is not to bail out. We're doing the full time of 90 days. The plan is to fill up the jails instead of paying the bail money so as to draw attention as possible, as much attention as possible to the injustices of the South Jim Crow law. It looks like I'll get out the last week in August, which means I'll only have about four or five days back home with you before returning to school. I know it's not much time, but that's all the time I'll have. My grades are fine this year, so don't worry about that, but I plan to become even more involved in Dr. King's movement in the coming year. I feel, for instance, we, the college students, and make a real difference and I want to be a part of it. I'll make every effort not to lose my scholarship, but depending on my involvement, I may have to cut back the number of classes, finish nursing in five years instead of four, because if I have to make a choice between helping colored people put food on their tables or getting a free ride at, at the University of Michigan, then I'll have to let the scholarship go altogether and, my work, and, and work my way through nursing school if I have to. And if I have to work, I wouldn't be the first. Of course, I know that uh, upsets you, 
But if you were down here, if you could see just how much suffering Negroes and myself are going through, you would understand my decision. I know you feel that my studies are more important than getting involved in Dr. King's movement. I can only agree to part of it. If I could find the time to pledge as you, mother, I, as you, mother, have insisted, I would do so on more than one occasion. Then I could find the time to help Dr. King's movement. Personally, I think Dr. King's movement is infinitely more meaningful than the two. Of course, I know my pledging this sorority is important to you, and I know you had your heart set on me becoming an AKA and continuing the tradition, but I'm just not overly excited about pledging. Not like I am about being involved in Dr. King's movement. But to put your mind at ease, if I can see my way clear to pledge before I graduate, I will. I can't guarantee it, of course, and I wouldn't want you to take it as a given. I don't mean to disappoint you, although I'm sure I have, but my pledging AKA or any other sorority at this time is nowhere near the priority for me that it is for you. Please try to understand. Well, the guards are sitting the lights out, and so I'll close. Please try not to worry about me. Know that I'm thinking of you each and every day, and I look forward to being home shortly. My sincere love to you always, your devoted daughter, September. Wow. So that gives you an idea. Now, when I wrote this, all this is true. Every, everything I've read to you is after I reached there to talk to people who were there who were in jails, and that's exactly what they went through, mm -hmm. precisely. Uh, let me see what I can do. Okay, this is the first time that, this is on the campus, this is the first time that anyone meets this new mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, This is during Howard's homecoming, and during homecoming, the sororities and the fraternities always have after parties. Well, this happens to be a party at the Kappa House, I must say. Uh, but anyway, there, uh, this is a, a, a house that's just after the pack. Uh, and the fraternity house in Washington is three stories, called Row House. It's three stories, and the basement is where they party downstairs. So they're, they're at this party, and Benny uh, Boy and Perry Mott are, are standing. Uh, they're, they're standing at the bar. Okay. Um, Ayanna Crawford saw him from her perch at the top of the stairs where she'd been surveying the dance floor. Nursing his drink, he appeared almost detached from the action and didn't seem to be making any moves on any of the three to one oversupplied women. In fact, it appeared he was turned away from the action altogether, gazing absently at the bar or down at his drink like he'd rather be someplace else. Then she saw the absolutely gorgeous man who joined him from time to time between rounds, and guess they were friends. Talk about a good-looking colored man. But his friend glued to the bar was another matter. Darker, thinner, bad hair. Nowhere near as handsome, but pleasing enough, and unless he was a budding alcoholic, might have potential. She didn't relish the heat, the trip down the stairs to the oven. But it was late, she was tired, and it was way past the part, and it was near the last part of homecoming. And she'd been to them all. The pickings were slim all weekend. The sorority parties, the ones that she could get into, were all duds. The private parties, not much better. And at the Alpha and Omega parties, no one had interested her. So she left to try her luck at the Kappa House before calling it a weekend. But she wasn't very optimistic until she'd seen the two men at the bar and hoped they were not married. All she had to do was meet them. She'd have her choice and knew from well-practiced experience they would both want her, the way all men want her. <laughs> she wasn't exactly Lena Horne, but the resemblance was uncanny, really, even on a bad day without makeup. On a good day, she was absolutely drop-dead gorgeous and knew it because everyone had told her so ever since she was a child, especially the men. They couldn't keep their eyes off her or their hands. She surveyed the crowd on the floor below. The girls were pretty, some of them, but there was no real competition. There never had been, there never would be. Showtime. The way she descended the stairs was like watching an old black and white Betty Davis movie in slow motion. The only thing missing was a director yelling action. Her movements, experienced and well-practiced, revealed her background. There was a certain elegance and bearing that showed off her physical assets, the best advantage without being obvious, and they were considerable. The exquisite copper-colored face, just barely touched with makeup, her ample chest elegantly draped in a clinging Dior sweater, 
a tight knee-length skirt that revealed the shapely definition of healthy thighs that controlled a pair of long, sexy legs on expensive, open-toed shoes that took each step with such precision and accuracy you knew she'd been formally presented to society. The diamond and sapphire earrings and matching necklace that caught the light and magnified it said money and a significant measure of Negro social standing. Every man who wasn't dancing or at the bar was watching her, waiting for her to descend the stairs, and as she did so, watched her with salivating tongues hanging out like the predators they were. <laughs> By the time she reached the floor, Ike and Tina Turner were halfway through the song. She pushed her way through the briar patch, brushed off several dozen or so invitations to dance, lame attempts to get her name, phone number, offers to take her home, wherever home was. And not used to being rejected, the would-be suitors followed her through the crust of the sardine can like she was a tight piper. When she finally reached the bar, Benny Boy's back was to the dance floor, hunched over his drink. She figured he'd noticed her in the mirror when he looked up, if he looked up. So she stood just inside his line of vision, a few inches from his shoulder. So if you were to speak, he'd have to turn around. She pretended to be searching for someone and not finding them turning as if to leave. Without being obvious, she could see his reflection in the mirror still staring down at his drink as if lost in thought. Nothing in his movements to suggest he was caught up in the spirit of the party or the beat of the music, if in fact he even heard the music. They were so close, the crowd pressed tightly together like refuse in a trash compactor. Even with the soulful sound of Tina Turner, Benny Boy never once looked up until she was pushed into him. His drink splashing out of the cup and onto the bar, some spilling onto his hand as he lifted his jacket. Benny Boy cursing under his breath, not looking up yet, but switching the cup and his remnants to the other hand, grabbing a napkin from the bar, drying his hand, and dabbing at his jacket sleeve. He said to his reflection, oh, oh, hey, I'm sorry, please accept my apology. It's just so crowded in here. I hope I didn't ruin your jacket. After a moment, Benny Boy brought his angry eyes up to the mirror. Startled, at first impression was it was Lena Horne standing at his shoulder, then blinking several times, realizing it wasn't. Realized, too, whoever she was was just as gorgeous, and for the first time felt the prominence of her breast presiding and pressing against him. Immediately his face softened, and he turned around as abruptly as the sorry he can would allow. Well, I tell you what, he said, I'll accept your apology if I can get your name and, and company for at least a drink. Ayana, she said, and squeezed in beside him, her eyes going immediately to his left hand, the absence of a wedding ring, or the shadow of one. The smile on the small round face said it all. Ayanna Crawford, I'll have a rum and coke, and you are Benjamin Jones. He couldn't tell her he couldn't tell her true complexion in the pale light of the bar, but since it was blemish free, skin tone of light caramel brown, her face was a Matisse. A true work of art on the canvas by an artist who understood the proportion of shape. Her features were arranged in exact proportion to the small round face of the Not entirely African, not entirely white. Her nose, a soft pointed hook above lips, not too thin, not too full, and whose narrow smile not only revealed a set of perfectly straight teeth, but drew attention to the single mole on the right side, riding just above the corner of her lip. Iona Crawford, Iona Crawford had small brown eyes, and long, delicate lashes that seemed to flow effortlessly beneath the protection of naturally proportioned eyebrows, not too thin, not too thick, and needing little, if anything, in the way of makeup. Her hair was so expertly styled, so expertly styled, Biddy Ward could not tell if it was good hair or bad. She wore it teased up on the top of an array of loose curls that seemed to fall accidentally across her forehead. And from the lush garden of hair, a well-shaped curl dropped down and looped tightly just in front of each ear. Adding to the voluptuous body, the face, well, he'd give, she'd give Lena Horne a serious run for her money any day of the week, double the odds if she could sing. Benny Boy turned away, brought his arm down hard on the bar, got the attention of, of the pledge, and got his drink. Where are you from, Ayanna? New Rochelle, she said. A New York girl. I'm from L.A. She seemed impressed and said so. Hollywood, you ever see any movie stars? Benny Boy laughed. If I could get a dollar for all the times people ask me that, I'd be rich. No, I haven't seen any movies yet. The pledge placed the drinks on the napkins just as Ike and Tina Turner surrendered, shop, surrendered to shop around by the mirror. Another barrage of shouts and the hand clapping erupted from the floor. Well, here's to you, Ayanna Crawford, Biddy Boy said as they raised glasses. 
But before they could touch glasses until Perry and Charlotte emerged on the ground and laughing hysterically squeezed next to Minnie Boy. Both soaking wet, but Charlotte, her huge eyes blinking rapidly, getting the short end of the stick, with her wet hair napping up around the edges like buckshot stuck to a magnet. <laughs> Perry said, Damn, it's hot in here! And slamming the palm of his hand down hard on the bar as he stood to the plate, Bring me another drink. If he noticed Ayana, it didn't show. He was too preoccupied with cooling off to make any real eye contact. Benny Boy said, Ayana, I'd like you to meet my man Perry. And Charlotte, I get it right? Yes, he's from LA too. And Charlotte, you're from where again? Memphis, Charlotte said, her eyes blinking behind her glasses. They exchanged introductions over Smokey Robinson's syrupy voice. Perry filling a napkin with ice cubes, rubbing them over his face and chest, offering some to Charlotte. Charlotte wanted a glass of ice water, Perry and Tom Collins, and when he came, drained nearly half the glass with a hand that Ayanna noticed was free of any wedding ring. The unseen smile inside Ayanna's face was, was even broader. Ayanna, he said after a moment, still trying to pull off. Now that's a name for the books. Depends on the book you're reading, Ayanna said, over the remember of her life. And quick on her feet, too, Perry said, happy. Where are you from, Ion? New Rochelle, New York. I go to Mount Holyoke. Ah, an Ivy League girl with brains. Then he held up his glass and added, correction, a colored Ivy League girl with brains. <laughs> now that is a combination to brag about, isn't it, Benny Boy? Benny Boy, Ion from? Nickname. Mount Holyoke, Perry said. How many colored girls they got there, Ion? Two or three, maybe? Ion said he was close, and they all left. Charlotte drank her water, then excused herself to go find the ladies' room. Down for the homecoming, huh? Perry Mott wanted to know. Leaving the Ivy League covered walls of Mount Holyoke, soak up a little culture from the motherland. It's kind of like the pin, re pin relays, I almost said. Perry and Penny Boy frowned at what the relays were about. Pin relays? He said, that's right. It's, you're, you guys are from the coast. It's like homecoming. Nobody cares about the races. It's just an excuse for big girls to party. But it's not nearly as much funny as much fun as it is here at homecoming. I may even transfer it. Benny Boy thought that was a great idea and said so. Perry agreed. And maybe run for homecoming queen, Ayanna suggested seriously. You'd win hands down, Benny Boy said. Ayanna smiled. She always smiled at the truth. Or maybe even cap a sweetheart, she said even more seriously. Like if she did, it was a done deal. No contest, Benny Boy said, and another smile of vanity lit up Ayanna's face. Of course, if I transfer, I might lose another year. I've already lost one when I went to study for so long. I got pneumonia real bad and had to come home early. Mount Holyoke made me start all over as a freshman. I don't want to do that again. So I'd be, I'd be an old woman by the time I graduate. You may be an old woman. You may be an old woman, Biddy Boy said, but you'd be the finest old woman in your class. <laughs> Ayanna smiled and sipped her linen coat, something else you knew she'd heard before. I'd be the finest woman in any class. Perry Mott almost choked with laughter. Talk about vain. This girl's in a class by herself, Benny Boy. <laughs> Why should I lie? I understand without apology. You'll get no argument out of me, Benny Boy said. They were all laughing. Uh -uh. When Charlotte returned, she noticed the necklace and said, That's a pretty necklace. Are they real? Charlotte asked, gesturing to Ayanna's necklace, the diamonds and sparkling sapphires catching the pale light of the clock. Ayanna touched the necklace briefly and said, All 25 carats. I bought it when I was in Paris. I had it especially made. It's a Cartier. Charlotte didn't know who or what Cartier was, but didn't let on. Either way, I figured it was expensive. <laughs> you speak French? She asked, trying to get back in the loop and sound intelligent, but feeling self-conscious about Ayanna's looks and her money, the subtle way she was looking at Perry Bach. I took it in high school. I got a chance to study at the Sorbonne, and sensing what Perry's hand was, was doing, and it, that it was without a ring, and not feeling jealous, but wondering what it would be like to sleep with him at just one time. So, Perry said to Ayanna between sips on what was left of the Tom Collins, what are you majoring in up there in Ivy League heaven? Sociology, Ayanna said. Charlotte's a sociology major, Perry said. The huge eyes said nothing but just moved around the corner of the glass. Education, I'm an education major, she said somewhat uncomfortably, beginning, beginning to get upset because she knew that Beginning to get upset because she knew that Perry was me. Beginning to get upset at the way Ayanna was staring at Perry by education. What about you guys, Ayanna said? What are you two guys made you mean? We're in med school, many boys said proudly, both of us. Second year. Med school? Did he say med school? Oh my God, yes he did. 
Hey, dirt. The cash register ringing so loud in my eyes that you'd you have to be deaf not to hear it. Greenmore didn't see it, but Perry did. Even even through the growing haze of Uncle Tom Collins, of Uncle Tom Collins, Ayana's eyes lit up like two sparkles at a Fourth of July celebration. Really, she said enthusiastically. My daddy's a doctor, a surgeon. In New Rochelle, many more said curiously, I wouldn't think there'd be enough colored folks in New Rochelle to keep a surgeon busy. Enough to send me to Mount Holyoke. Ooh wee, there's just no end to this girlfriend's conceit, is there, Perry said, grinning. I don't mean to be conceited, I said, lying, knowing she'd been conceited all her life, because she was raised that way and not apologizing. But you're right, if it was just Negroes, he couldn't survive. But he doesn't just operate on colored people. He has a lot of white patients in his practice. In fact, most of his patients are white. Okay. Boy and I out across the talk at the bar through another round of drinks and the next ten references. Perry and Charlotte returned on the 11th record and went straight for the dance floor. Ayana was picking up on the fact that Charlotte was just temporary for Perry. Last night in the clips, slow dreamy ballad, every beat of my heart, turned down the pace, changed the mood for the last hours of homecoming, and finding a dime sized spot on the dance floor, Benny Boy taking Ayana in his arm, pulling her close, the whiff of erotic perfume tying them together. Ayana letting her body settle comfortably into his, giving him a real sense of what he could expect. Expensive ring fingers stroking his neck, her lips neatly snuck, her lips nestled snugly below his ear, her voice humming along softly and perfect pitch with Gladys Knight. And whether he realized it or not, Benny Boy was no longer consumed with his disappointment over September's absence. In his mind, she was about to be replaced. As for Ion Crawford, she may have been dancing with Benny Boy, but not once did she ever take her treacherous eyes off of Perry Mark. Mm -hmm. So that, that gives you sort of an idea in terms of of, of, of where the three characters are going in, in that, and that, and it just sort of progresses on, on to this. Any particular questions so far? Yeah. 